Welcome to Philly Coco Presents Side Project Spotlight, episode 56. This is a developer's journey to making cool stuff. I'm Kotaro. I'm Steve. And I'm Aaron. And we are Philly Coco, a Philadelphia-based Coco Heads community focused on Apple development. That primarily, but not exclusively means iOS, Mac, tvOS, watchOS, and visionOS development. Philly Coco's two desire is to take you higher on your own developer journey. Whew. All right. Yes. <laughs> you did <Clean> it. Take. <laughs> <laughs> Very uh, nice. Very nice. Thanks, uh, thanks. So uh, before we get started today, I'd like to mm-hmm. just look at we're gonna just point out that this is this is our final episode of twenty twenty three. Yes. We're gonna take uh, December so- off. So when this comes out, it should be the beginning of December. Uh and I don't know if we'll I mean I I might I might I could re-upload old stuff or whatever, but I don't know if that's really useful because that's, yeah. I always thought that was a little weird podcast when I do that. But uh, sure. there's probably not going to be anything new until uh, January then, if, once you're hearing this. Yep. But So that means uh, have a good holiday season. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, so besides that, like, what, what, is, uh, what, what do we want to talk about today? Uh, today we want to have a kind of a discussion around the idea about dependencies and kind of a broad and, and uh, kind of in a broad sense, but I think one of the reasons why uh, we're kind of going in this path is um, as my own personal side project, um, I've been kind of exploring and trying to push metal shaders um, in unique, fun and unique ways. But that wasn't the only thing I was working on, even though metal shaders is taking a majority of my time, my spare time, so to speak, of like learning. Um, which I do recommend everybody explore because that's going to be a fascinating thing to add to your apps. In the oh yeah, I've, I, I, I've been um, seeing a lot of metal shader talks show up and posts about it. Yeah, yeah. So expect that to be a hot new thing going forward. But mm-hmm. as attention, so <laughs> hot as in everybody's phones melting down. Ooh, yes, yes, hot. yes. Mm-hmm. Look. Video games don't care about your GPU. <laughs> okay, so or your, or your battery. <laughs> or your battery. <laughs> Who needs battery life? I gotta Who make my app pop. You gotta make it pop. You know that's uh, that's our that's part of our job. You know, you gotta make it you gotta make it sizzle, <laughs> quite literally in some cases. But because because you're you're uh, on this metal shader thing, you're you're thinking about and, dependencies because uh, and, and, one. Oh, so. Um, Getting getting on, on on a side note, when people ask, you know, if people don't know, metal shaders is just a great way to um, give your app uh, more visual flair, uh, more relatively uh, easy amount of reusable code called shaders. Yeah, so, and we mean metal is the Apple framework. Metal Apple framework for um, their version of the GS GLSL uh, shader. That's yeah. sort of like they write it in a C based style. Uh, approach but the the terminology is generally are the trans uh translatable one yeah. not one necessarily one to one but close enough and then there's um, a there's a there's an easy way of using them in swift ui now yeah you can just basically access them through a modifier um and then you can call the shader directly in the modifier and because it's a dynamic lookup uh you just do something like sh- uh, in a metal shader modifier called like say color effect you can and this is ios 17 by the way um but in the color effect modifier, you can call something called a shader library dot, you know, pixelate, and that'll help more. That, and then you give it the parameters, and that'll morph yeah. your your image, for example, into a pixelated version of itself. And so, um, uh, uh, this would be an example of a dependency, then. That, um, yes and no, but I mean, in a sense, like one of the things, reasons why, kind of going on this weird tangential, is like I was also exploring, I'm beginning to explore using GitHub um, instead of Unity. So uh, for context, uh, Unity is a G- game. Godot, you mean? Godot, yeah. Yeah, Godot. Godot. Um, I don't know if it Godot really, it sounded like GitHub. Oh, did you I'm say sorry. GitHub Godot. or is this my mind? I might have said GitHub. Godot. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. Well, my brain. Godot is like G-O dot, it, it, G-O-D-O-T. It's robot, it? but instead of R, you use G, yeah. Yeah, and so but it's not Godot. Spelled. Like waiting for Godot. Yeah, if you've never, waiting for Godot. Yeah. Is very, which yeah. is very funny, by the way. But. Yes. Yeah. In fact, that they they had to clarify that because everybody called it uh, ghetto or gato or what, something like that. What's Goto. this go dot? 
The Go <laughs> Dot. Yeah, Go Dot. What is this? Is that a new version of? Is that like a merge version of? You know, Go and C Sharp or something. But anyway, um, the uh, but no, it's a game engine, uh, very lightweight. Um, oh, go ahead. You were about to say something, Aaron. Or, um, so it's. Oh no! Is, this, is that open source or? Yes, that's another reason why it's so MIT licensed open Good source deal. on GitHub. <laughs> Uh, so you can explore it. Um, it you it it can use C sharp as its language, and unlike Unity, uh, the recommended approach is to use the proprietary GD script language. Um, and if you needed to really? do something more high performance, you can use like either C sharp or C plus plus in what they call a GD extension. So you can kind of extend. Um, uh, if you need to do something, uh, you know, something a little more high performance, you can you can kind of extend um, your game that way versus like being mm. so dependent. So um, because I think their their issue fundamentally comes around the garbage collection component of it, and so you know you're you're stuck with those momentary pauses that can happen in the most inopportune times, and there's no control of when that happens. Um, yeah. So. The that was the fundamental reason why they're certain, but they do allow you to use mono, uh, no, I'm sorry, dot net, um, if you wanted to, like, if, uh, so you can use C sharp if you wanted to. Um, and so, the the reason you were trying out Godot is so that you had an alternative to Unity because of the recent, uh, if, I don't know, I think we talked about before the recent the fiasco, Unity I mean, drama. There's been a lot of drama yeah. lately in the tech world. <laughs> A lot of company a lot like of structure drama and business model drama. Oh geez, what, how many can we can we name? There's the crypto drama with the SBF. There's the AI drama with OpenAI, and this drama here yeah. with Unity. So to summarize, basically Unity in some you know you know genius wisdom decided they were going to change the terms of service uh, to being a. Uh, instead of allowing for you to be able to install the runtime, you know, to as many devices as you want, uh, they're going to charge a certain amount, like a couple cents mm-hmm. per download. Right. And, and so how would they be able to track that? Uh, and, and not only that, right. That would be fine. Right. Who cares? All right. It's your business model. Do what you want. But they were going to say, and this terms of service is actually retro, um, what do they call that retro retroactively applied it was retroactively to, applied yeah to past versions so how would you calculate that even if you wanted to like uh, and so they're going after the genshin impacts or the the sort of free to play games yeah so um, it's it, there was a whole thing i don't like want to get too much in the weeds about any yeah, of these yeah, particular yeah. dramas but the point is there was a lot of drama about unity changing his business model that would affect a lot of indie like game developers especially right and so it I, was I it say was probably close well, to anyway, more, like w- yeah middle-sized game developers yeah so it was it was it was a, it was drama about how they were changing the business model and it's like okay so if you're in a situation where and when we talk about dependencies there's a lot of there's different ways we can look at it but we're talking about mainly like like dependencies as in third-party platforms sure. or libraries that you don't control like you didn't write but that are required for your software application to work and something like unity is an example of a platform where you would have to rewrite your entire game mostly if you had to switch right. depending on yes. and so you're looking at godot as an alternative to build on azure platform or is godot like unity compatible like could you use unity and then switch to godot no, you you just you, you just looking at it as an alternative platform with this open source. I have seen people who were able to convert their project, which ironically mm-hmm. is really huge, um, to Godot in relatively short time, but it's a lot of work. There's no question. Yeah, I guess about it depends that. on right how much of the things you've written in their proprietary scripting language versus yeah. like regular right. C sharp. Right. If it's regular C sharp, it's not terrible. Uh, if you decide that like, you're going to u- convert a lot of that stuff to GD script, which is their proprietary language, um, you're going to run into um, you. You might run into a little more issues. Now, GD script is like a Python based language, so you know your your mileage may your mileage may vary based on your experience with Python. Um, and, and, and so, just to keep some structure to this, 
the something like a platform dependency since it's like uh it's a it's something you you once you choose it you can't easily back out of it but it also includes yeah. something like like uh what's the vendor platform you're building on like apple itself is a platform like if we choose to build yeah. an app so called natively we're I we're think- saying we're going to we're going to use apple's you know tooling apple's libraries and stuff and that mm-hmm. is our platform and if apple yeah. changed things out from under us then we have to adapt as well which has happened but i yeah, think which happens, the, yeah. yeah um and that's sort of the contract <laughs> the deal with the devil as you would say um that you make knowing you know so you know full well like okay like i'm going in there you're not going in the, is this particularly in the apple platform you're not going in blind you should be going in blind saying like oh you know like i have no control over like say pencil kit i would love it that i could like add some kind of flood filled you know component to it but you know, that's something I would have to build out myself or we couldn't have like the open source community expand on that, that framework. Like we're dependent on Apple to fix those bugs or those feature or add those features. Right. And you can't get around having dependencies. So we're not saying yeah. we're not trying to say they're bad or anything. It's just, uh, there's different kinds and the platform yeah. one is like the first one you're going to, you're going to pick as a, uh, as a developer of anything. I mean, it, that includes hardware too. Like if you want to make something for, iPhones, well, I mean, like it's easy. You may not think about it as a, as a dependency, but you're saying that I'm choosing a particular hardware that has particular features. I'm picking a particular vendor, and then if you choose to use to build it natively, then you're saying I'm going to use Apple as my uh, my primary set of dependencies. Uh, you don't have to. Like there are there are other ways of building things on the iPhones, but they all ultimately depend on apple at like underneath to some degree they have to rely upon apple provided uh, or you know vendor provided apis in order to build mm-hmm. something even if you use something um on this like cross-platform uh because i, mean, it, I could you see, have to like get through the build chain yeah i mean i see a lot of companies that will build um you know like figma or um what was that one built in rust i forgot that on the core engine side was that figma uh, or I think I thought that was C plus plus that they built like, the core engine part of it in in that platform. Yeah. But then like they use like WebAssembly or something to like like um, flesh that out. I mean, I could be I'm I'm talking completely out my butt. But there were some there are some like, there's some platforms. I mean, I'm sure like app applications like Procreate or something do something much more low level to get as much performance juice out of it. But then yeah. that becomes their secret sauce to say that's why it's hard exactly. to replicate and, right yeah and if you're on the web you have you have different kind of concepts of platform dependencies yeah because yeah. there's more abstractions available to you that are and then you're, you're so you're not dependent on a particular browser because mostly the the platform on the web is if you're if you're talking about like front end stuff like things in running in the browser it's the browser but then there's like abstractions on top of that and there's ways of writing your code that you know um so that they're not dependent on a, a like being dependent on Safari or Chrome or something. Although most things People on the web do, do that to be all the time. Yeah. On oh, only works on Chrome. Yeah, I know. I was like, most. I mean, technically, <laughs> you could build. You could build things right now. <laughs> yeah, run Chrome right now because it only works on Chrome properly. So it's like even even on the web, which is considered the 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 space where you can have the least platform lock in. You still have platform lock in. Like you, yeah. you, at some point, you just have to ch- you have to choose what your platform is going to be because. Uh, I mean, I guess unless you want to build like literally from like assembly up, I guess maybe, maybe you can build everything yourself. But you know, it's you're you're getting a lot of value from all of the uh, accrued decades of of work that went into building a platform, whether it be a browser and the associated like extensions there, or an operating system like iOS or macOS or Windows. I mean, you're going to pick one of those things as your platform. You're going to target it, uh, and even if you use a cross platform tool that like outputs to like iOS and Android. It's still in some ways dependent on the specific, you know, vendor stuff underneath. You just may not be directly inter- interacting with it. So you just have to be aware of what the platform is you're, you're working on. And something like game development, as you were saying, uh, if or, 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 or whatever you're working on, if the platform vendor is somebody you can trust or not, like you have to, you have to, you have to consider the long term viability. Like I don't think Apple is going to go out of business anytime soon. I think it's going to be, mm-hmm going to be good same thing with like android if you're on that platform like I, sure. it's going to be around for the indefinite future so you know that your your software at least work if you keep it updated but you know 
or and and, and I don't think their business models are necessarily going to change too much for from our perspective. But but you know who I knows? Mean, but that's another consideration. The the unity thing is more of a business model, um, you know, the, issue. The, right. The funny thing is, like it's it it, but it speaks to a lot of. Um, yeah. I think challenges for those type of public companies. So Unity is a public company. I'm sure they had a lot of pressure to even make that money <laughs> to, to make that money back because it was a you know it was um and the and the and they they purchased a lot of other companies. They also purchased something like Iron Forge or I forget the name of it. It's like Iron. It's kind of like ad based uh, quote unquote malware spyware service or something. It was kind mm. of bizarre. Um, uh, clearly a more like a, a nepotism buy or something, but it was because um, their friends were in that that company. But the the um, the the funny part about that was like they were going to use that to be the thing that tracks your runtime, like how your how your runtime downloads. Right, um, right. So yeah, so, one of the one of the concerns was that you'd have to run code, or code would be run via their SDK without your right. you know without input your, that would. You know, gather it, it would have to be phoning home probably, and like gathering some kind of data about uh, about you know your your app at runtime, and that's one of those things that you have to pay attention to. We'll, we can talk about it as at any level of dependencies, sure. uh, the but, whether or not you know you have a privacy or security concern. You know, and that's the funny part too, because like on on the, I, from a pure moral perspective, yeah, you can argue that all day, but like one of my one of my fundamental problems when people talk about bloat is uh, analytics take up a huge <laughs> chunk of your binary like it's absurd the the ridiculous amount of bulk they add and everybody's like well we have to have it it's like no you don't have to have it. not this one <laughs> you know like adobe would like take up like 100 megs <laughs> it just feels like and <laughs> that, that, that and that's like, good segue into uh, library dependencies oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah because yeah <laughs> Yeah, because that's like the bulk of dependencies you're probably gonna you know, you're gonna encounter. But and like analytics is right up there. And I was thinking of analytics when I was when I was mentioning security thing because and the privacy thing because you know that comes up a lot. And what was I thinking? I mean, there's no reason the, why um, Fire, Firebase has to have all these. Like they basically took all the things that were sort of separate, like Crashlytics, AdMob. Um, their cloud and, and yeah. they put it into one SDK, which I guess is convenient, <laughs> but it yeah. makes this thing, this huge, massive chunk of, of, of dependencies <laughs> wrapped up in one library <laughs> or one package. Kind of a platform in itself. So yeah, everybody wants to be a platform ultimately because you can't, yeah. you can't leave easily. Yeah, <laughs> once exactly. You they want to lock you in. Yeah. You can't go anywhere I else mean, easily. Like, I get it. I get it. But just, it's like, it's one thing to have like dependencies that are lightweight, right? Let's just say like a simple, yeah. you know, extensions of, of things that you think uh, the color view should have, like a, maybe like a hex parameter or something or something just very oh, now vanilla. We're, now, we're like, right? now we're down to like variable dependencies. Well, right? yeah, variable I'm just saying as, a, as like a yeah. simple example, but like in terms of like, um, or like if I wanted to, or like convenience functions right or something of that nature or even like the swift algorithms yeah. is, is a good example of like adding some ex extensions that allow you to do much more functional style or yeah. more concrete styles of algorithm algorithmic um function um calculations the 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 thing that i hate or I, not hate is a strong word i dislike is um you don't hate it I try not to. I try but to like. Know. I need. I, I I save hate for like really, really, really dastardly. Yeah, yeah. I kind of kind of want to like separate the two. Um. The. Uh. The. Uh, the 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 Firebase stuff, right? Or like the stuff where like ninety five percent of the stuff I don't need. Like even like yeah. It, it, it was as an indie developer, so what? But as a as a as a corporation, right? Like if I'm a corporation, like. Yeah, like that would drive me nuts. It drives it drives me nuts too because I have I have old versions of it. I think I need to upgrade from Cocoa Pods on one project, and it's like last time I tried to do that, it broke everything, and it's like oh. Right. Well, that's a, that's another thing for dependencies. You're what you're using to manage dependencies. That's like the mother of all dependencies. <laughs> I mean, if we're going back to like sort of the platform one, I always think about like companies that buy companies that buy companies. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So, so like you know, I, I I was thinking like, oh yeah, for you know, like something 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 
sometimes like, I'll, I'll get stopped in my tracks because like, for example, Linode just um, fairly recently, maybe like a year or two ago, got bought by, um, what's that film? What's that? Alchemy? Oh, they got bought? Okay. Yeah, they got bought by, uh, I don't know if they're still Linode by by name, but I know like, like because they bought bought by Akamai, I'm like, oh, I, I should wait till that settles down, right? So that like affects my, you know, my buying decision or like experimental decision because like I want to see how it shakes out for this new product or this new version. Um, uh, what is a buddy build? Buddy build was like <laughs> buddy build. Really yeah, it disappeared for wonderful. like three years or something, right? Before it came back, as, exactly. I don't even so, know. Did it come back? <laughs> Back yeah. Like, well, no. It, it came back right? as yeah. It's, it, it's um the library dependencies and tool dependencies kind of are in my mind a blurry line, you know. So yeah. like you know, most of the time we're thinking about dependencies. We're thinking about some library, some SPM or, or CocoaPod or whatever we're downloading. But well, then, like, as you said, like, you know, something like the the, the backend infrastructure is, is as I said, is a dependency. It's something like tools you're using. Xcode is a dependency. Technically, I mean, like, uh, like or, a lot of, you know, like a lot of people who like uh, were using OpenAI's um, APIs, right? Like, those yeah. terms of services can change on a dime or change with management. <laughs> who knows? Right? <laughs> same, same, same way I thought about Unity in that sense of like the sort of like this existential crisis. Not necessarily, you know, that I'm making a game at the moment, but if I'm thinking about long term, like, do can I trust this company to be around and? and not like screw with my like you know my budget or my expectation of what my budget should be um that'll be great you know but that's that's that when we talk about sort of platform dependencies i mean that you know cost becomes a a conversation right um yeah i mean something like the like the open ai apis is that a platform is that a library it's kind of like both it depends on how much you're you're integrating with it, I guess. Because if you build your entire product on top of it, like your entire product is just like an interface to Chat GPT, which is probably right. not something I'd recommend doing. <laughs> but no, so a lot of people do have done that. that. But that that <laughs> would be like essentially using the library as your platform. But if you're adding it as like a feature, so your your product still has value and it's not going to disappear if OpenAI goes out. And the reason we're talking about OpenAI here is because if when you're listening to this, you probably know. But like there was so much drama about their the, the CEO being fired and coming back, I think. And there's all this. And I think during this, at one point, there was an outage. And so it's just like if you're dependent on some vendor or some startup, especially, which is what OpenAI is, right? It's a startup, technically. So it, even though Microsoft like invests a lot, but it's like you're, you're gambling there. And if it goes down, what are you going to do? And how much of your product is going to be affected by that? You know, is it one tab? on your app or is it like your entire product now is not usable by anybody? I mean, that's, that's like a, an, an, is there an alternative? I mean, I don't even know what you would do as an alternative to, if you were integrating with open AI, cause it's all still very new and proprietary. Are, like there isn't, are there any, big, what are, what are the there other, are other companies, but I don't know. Yeah. I see. I mean, there's a lot of places that use the GPT model. Like, I mean, I think there's Azure services you can buy. They use the open AI stuff. So I don't know if they're like, dependent on their servers i think they run them on i think microsoft runs a model on their own servers but you know stuff like that comes up but i don't know how like one-to-one interchangeable any of that stuff is because i haven't looked deeply at the apis that you can access and they keep changing them like this as we talked about last time does does google expose theirs or bard yeah bard or they have something i I, i'm i don't know I, i haven't looked at bard recently but I mean, everybody's going to be providing some API, but it's like, are they all going to, I don't think they're all providing the same API. You know, how, like you can get S3 and you can get um, Backblaze version of the S3 API, you know, like everybody kind of standardized on an API. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't think we're there yet. I don't know if we're there yet for the, uh, these language models, right? These various systems and and something like um, OpenAI said they were going to do, which was, they call them GPTs, which is like little customized models like i don't know it's like they all if, i don't know models, how easy it is so this is a dumb this is probably a dumb question but are those models downloadable like localized in the sense that you can take mm. the model and then run them on your your own devices or you know, on not your not that i'm aware of no not that I'm aware of however okay. this kind of leads into like how, how do you manage all this chaos so you have like platforms you have libraries and stuff and like how do you manage that so that if open ai goes down you can you can like maybe switch to the Microsoft version of it or something, you know, 
uh, that's uh, you know that's a that's 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 a, its Wait. own talk in itself. We only but well, the Microsoft is the money people, right? For open AI, so <laughs> I guess they would just buy them out. I, you know the 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 I don't the weird corporate structure of open AI is its own podcast. <laughs> I don't understand it fully. <laughs> Apparently, everybody just over the last weekend before we were recording this, um, like before the holiday, when all this went down. Uh, apparently, a lot of people learned that OPI is a weird <laughs> corporate structure, it's like a nonprofit um, and a for-profit wing, and right, a lot of craziness. Right, right. L- not the standard like standard startup. What you know, you you would expect. I, I think it's more standard than you would think, but it, yeah, in this case, in the way it's structured, it's not that. That, yeah, yeah, that part's not standard, um, particularly when you don't have proper stakeholders. Um, yeah, the the but getting back to sort of like when we talk about litigating or managing, um, yeah, uh, platform dependencies. I guess from a, I guess we can kind of go down the list of like if it was a platform specific stuff, it's almost like you're you're sort of stuck, right? And at least maybe if you know what your alternatives are, or at least you know that there is a plan B, that should be enough. Like, in my case, for a game development, I know there are several plan Bs. Um, it's just a lot of tedious and hard work to migrate. And you're never, it's, it's, it's very rare it's going to be a one-to-one because, like, if you try to migrate this game, or maybe you just say, you know what, I'm going to sunset this game, and this game will be as it is for the, you know, perpetuity, yeah. and you're going to have to use emulators to sort of get around the, the problem of, like, trying to, like, preserve it. Um, oh, emulators, yeah, yeah, because you know, there's ways you can structure code. We can talk about about sure. helping you swap out dependencies, but there's also trade offs in doing that kind of work. And it's not, it's still something like a game that's still not the same. If you changed, even if you somehow built your game right so that you had a totally like independent API that you built your game on, and then underneath that, I mean, you had you could swap out the engine or something, right? Which I mean, huh. the engines are still—they still perform differently. They still have different features, and they're not—they're not, they're I mean, not even, all one-to-one interchangeable, right? Like the Unity engine is no, not no, the no, same no, thing no, as no, like no. like the, you know, the, like like you, you, if you talk about the physics engine, for example, that's a really yeah. good example of like it, you know, depending on the point, you know, the point release version, like the physics engine could be totally different, so it can react yeah. differently. Yeah, even if you um, had like an API that you built to wrapped around a, the physics sure. engine. Which you probably would do anyway. It doesn't matter if you change physics, and you still probably have to change other things because um, it's going to so act. There are a lot of games that were designed for the CRT screen, right? So, oh yeah, the or the or the, they, the weird quirks of the hardware, the consoles. So when you get to emulate, right, 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 right. So like you got to <laughs> you know, emulate the input, the input lag, or you got to emulate or the bugs. The, uh, <laughs> Sometimes the bugs, the bugs or, yeah. I mean, or uh, like if you're a CRT screen, like they're they're obviously yep. like a square shape. Um, um, aspect ratio or not basically not games are the worst right. for 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 this <laughs> for like managing dependencies it's like right it's like, so so for my it's like the hardest thing to build is a game it's one of the hardest yeah. software projects to build i i think and that's fine like you can that's why you have so many remakes <laughs> exactly but, and, uh, and I, i'm always amazed on how they can get those remakes work isn't it sometimes is it sometimes true that they just not just but i mean like they have to build an emulator or they use an emulator as part of the remakes to get stuff to work like I don't know how they remake some Sometimes, old old games are written in like I don't know C or whatever, and then they try to run it on. on they have like a like a modern the Dark Souls. They they have a there's a documentary. Um, if you go on YouTube and you do a no clip, um, they have a Dark Soul like I think it was three um, where they remade the like they had a documentary documentary around how they did that, how they sort of like had to stand take two controllers and like two television screens and like do a one to one like check to see like if it's close enough. I mean, it was a complete remake in this, in all sense of the word, but they did. They took a lot of the assets and they sort of had to like <clears throat> up res. They, re- the they rewrote all the code. They didn't use the original source code. I believe because they don't, they couldn't find it. I think. Oh, because I mean, I'm thinking of um, <clears throat> like on the Switch, that stuff's the emulators. Switch. Like the like the yeah, Game yeah, Boy, yeah, the yeah, N64. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those things are emulated. Like right. they're emulators that they so they're they're actually running. I think like they're running at least some version of the original code. Mm-hmm. For the game, like yeah. Donkey Kong Country's Donkey Kong Country's code in an emulator, which I thought is right. how you would do it for a lot of games. If so um, it, I guess the, yes. it depends on how much modification you want to make. You could do it that way, unless you're like very serious about modernizing the yeah. the code base to be, I guess, future proof is probably a bad way to describe it, but more like yeah. bring it up to sort of like a modern 
like keep the spirit of the game but um and maybe even like the pathways and maybe like play with some of it but fundamentally just um rewrite it for like a modern and so they do their best to mimic the physics of that engine uh but they don't necessarily you know like at at some point you know they're like okay well this is (laughs) we gotta we we, we gotta just accept that this is this is gonna act a little differently Um, so so i think those are those are interesting approaches to like like sort of up you know in in the game world like resolving that sort of dependency or like concern about like okay like if i'm moving to a new platform like gotta rebuild it from scratch we're talking like a website or an app uh probably you know you're basing it a lot on the um in the apps world we would probably base a lot of our, or whatever the modern hig requires right or suggests. oh yeah yeah um, um so going from skeuomorphism to you know flat to back to back to like a new morphism style <laughs> yeah but i mean when they and so that's an that's an example of uh platform dependency changes and if you were using apple's controls for things mm-hmm. primarily then when the change for ios 7 for, for instance happened you got that new design language quote unquote for free and all the sure. controls that you were using in the standard way that apple's apis describe how to use them it was the custom really highly customized apps that had the hardest time navigating that time period and uh and oh, since yeah. then you know because if you, if you had a highly skewomorphic thing as you said something like a design like a a whole redesign of the operating system platform you're working on like visually means that you're gonna have to update your app and how much work that involves depends on a lot of factors and uh in in the case with i remember the ios 7 transition it was just like oh everything changed but if you were using you know like a standard table and stuff then you got a lot of that for free uh uh and it, it came down to how much you were customizing stuff and so then it, that that kind of leads into how do you how do you kind of deal with dependencies in your app like there's lots of different techniques right and i, I don't we, we can't go into all of them or in too much of the weeds but we are a developer podcast so i figured we should talk a little bit about like a little bit more concretely how you do this in Swift, specifically okay. in an iOS app. Let's like constrain it down here. And specifically in like, a, if you have a library dependency, mm-hmm. okay, <clears throat> and you know, you and, and uh, a depend, it, uh, dependencies can also be things you build, you know, like yourself that you're going to use in your app or in multiple mm-hmm. apps. But sure. if you're going to use, if you're going to have a, a design your, your software so that you can control dependency, like what are the ways you want to control a dependency so that you can you can manage the change when you want to change things. So I think one of them is um the big obvious one that comes to mind is protocol oriented programming, the crusty talk if you're from WWC years ago. Sure. Pro- protocols are in Swift, they're not exactly the same as interfaces are in other languages, but if you've never done Swift and you've done C sharp or Java or something, you think kind of think of an interface. It's it's a schematic, it defines here are the properties and the functions for this protocol and then you can form the protocol with an actual concrete type where you have to implement whatever was listed in the protocol and you can conform it in exactly one way so like you can't have a type conform to a protocol multiple times just, just and then uh, you have multiple types conform to the protocol in different ways but not in within one type so you you do it that way and that way you could uh have a dependency like on uh what's a good what's a good example of a dependency you would be creating a protocol around i mean there's lots of built-in protocols but i mean like right. like I'm, I'm trying to be like more more like something the third party that you would you would you, you would use this technique for database access is a common one network kind of access is a common network, one for sure um i don't remember there, so so one of the, one of the things like if you're doing like a theme <laughs> if you're theme. Doing a theme i'm trying to do themes I, I started to talk <laughs> on themes last night okay so how do you deal with uh, themes oh yeah i saw i saw a good you, talk you, you, that, you, about about this last night from Pragma. You, can, you could technically enforce a protocol around certain properties around the theme um, for either a button or a label, for example. You could have the same protocol based on a certain theme or per- certain parameters around the theme. Yeah, so the, to, in the, the talk I saw on Pragma, they, uh, I think it was Pragma mm-hmm. Conference, I think it was called, they had um, token-based design. So they had oh, like in Figma, they they started in Figma and they made you know your base color. Mm-hmm. Then you would make the design the, that would be like the base token. Then you had the design. Just an example. Then a design token would be 
And so the base, the base color would be like um, some yellow color. It would be probably be called something like you know like ven you know like base yellow or something vendor yellow. But then the token you actually use in your app or whatever would probably be called like uh, you know like you know accent color or something. And then and then uh, so that way accent color could refer to any specific color. You know what I mean? So in the, so in Figma, you start like the, you start with the base, and then you, you start with those base colors, and you start create these tokens that uh, that are named whatever makes sense to you. So, but then you 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 would have like a button would be one of the tokens, right? And then like a button, like uh you know colors uh, color for the button or a text to put on the button, whatever. So you'd have these different tokens. But the way they implement on Swift is protocols. So you'd have a protocol that would be like for um, colors, and there'd be a protocol for like i think like buttons <laughs> and that would be inside there would be color so you could the thing you could do with protocols you can kind of um wait are they are they are they grouped together let's so you have like a protocol button and color or or is it like is it nested they're they're using um a form of atomic design if you ever read i think his name brad brad frost is that his name brad frost you ever, you ever looked at atomic design you start with um well the way it's 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 described in that book is like atoms and molecules and like like life forms I don't know it gets a little weird but it's basically you start with with a few base level things that are just uh in their in their case things that are numbers so a color can be represented by a series of numbers you know an animation like these very base level things and then you uh then you start building up from there and like a button could be one of these you know tokens so you have like a a primary, you know, button color you use for things would be like a token, a primary button color. So then in your, in your Swift, you can get this data, you can do it manually or you can get it as like a JSON file from some API or whatever, and then use codable to grab it. But the way they had set up was a, was a, um, a protocol. So that way, a, and uh, a, that way you could swap it out. You could have, you could, you could have multiple implementations of that protocol. A simple example would be, say you had a color Say you had a like a color protocol, okay, yeah. and the color protocol had vari- variables for like primary color, secondary color, text color, shadow color, etc., like that, okay. And then you have a default implementation that has those colors. If you wanted to have a, a a different theme, you know, like a holiday theme or something, then you would you would create a type called like holiday theme that would conform to the color protocol, right? And then you'd have different values for each one of those colors in there. And then everywhere in your application where you wanted to use this uh, this this color theming um, uh, type, you would instead of bringing in a specific type, you'd bring in the protocol. So at the like initializer of of your view, you would have as a as a dependency it would take in would be something like theme, and then the type of the theme would be the color protocol. And then what you could pass into is either holiday theme or standard theme. And those would be the names of two concrete types that conform to the protocol. And so like, that's a way that you can decouple your dependencies uh, from where you're using them in your app so that if you change something, uh, you can not have to rewrite everything in your application. That's like a very basic example. And the example I saw, and I'll, I'll find the link again for this Pragma talk because I'm not really explaining it well because I watched it like 1 a.m. last night. <laughs> but it was a, it was an excellent talk about and it was from had designer and a programmer involved so you got to see both sides of it from like the figma side to how you actually implement it in code on the swift side and it was all about protocols it was like it was like a struct it was like protocols and then you'd have like a you know you have a struct and then you'd have he it went actually multiple levels i think went they went three levels deep with the protocols you don't have to and in my my trivial example i just said there I'm, there's just one protocol but you know you can have like a protocol that has like a a variable in the in the protocol that is also another protocol, so then you can nest them when you implement them, and that's what they did to make it to break yeah. it up. But but protocol oriented programming is the de facto way of handling dependencies in Swift. Uh, you can and there's there's another another cool technique I saw. I mean, it's not really new or anything, but you can use a if you have multiple dependencies. You need to put into to something. You can you the one technique I saw was use a type alias, okay. and then the type alias, and then you combine the protocol names with an at sim, not at with um, what's the, what is that symbol called? The and symbol. I don't remember what the actually typographic name is called. The uh, the, like the is it is the it and the, the at, 
not at symbol, the, the uh, and, the yeah, and symbol. Ampersand? Yeah. Is it ampersand? Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the and. Anyway, you, uh, yeah. you could say like, uh, you can, you can have a protocol one and protocol two. And so you have type, a, type alias dependency equals protocol one and protocol two and protocol three. And that way you can compose the dependencies together so that the type that you pass in to your initializer is instead of how ha- is now the type is whatever that type alias is. And then that type has to conform to multiple protocols. So that way oh, you can. Yeah. So this was, I mean, I, I'm sure I, other people come up with this and I, I didn't come up with this specifically. Mm-hmm. I saw it. Um, Merrowing, if you ever hear of Merrowing, his, uh, uh, his, I always, I can't pronounce his name, it's Christoph. I, I hope you post I cannot, links in our, in our I'll post the links. Uh, I'll post the links in here. I cannot pronounce his name. Christoph Zap, 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 I can't pronounce his name. I'm sorry. Merrowing on, on X and everywhere. He's kind of famous in the community. He did t, a lot of TCA stuff. He had, um, he, he talked about his blog year, I think years ago about doing protocol composition for dependency injection. And that's what he did. And so he basically standardized on one type alias name. It looked like it says like dependencies. So everywhere in the app, it would, it would. So everywhere in the app, you, your initializer would just have the one dependencies type to bring in, but the actual va- value of that dependencies could, could be changed depending on the, you know, where, you know, what it actually needed. Uh, right, something like right, that. So, right. so that's another way of using protocols. That's why protocols are powerful, but they have um, they have their own you know downsides too. In mm-hmm. scenarios where you might want to have multiple conformances, for instance, you can't do that. You know, like if you want, like the theme one is another good example. If you have, you can't have you can't have like a type. Well, actually, you know, it's a really good example. I saw um, an NS screencast video about this when I was doing the research for this talk. He, um, if you wanted to do uh, uh, if you wanted to do like a codable and they, they were talking about codable, if you wanted to say have one type, your struct, which represents like a user. Okay. has a name and whatever. And so now when you get it, when you do a get request to the API, you use the, you, you do the entire thing, normal codable thing, you get the whole thing. But what if you want to do a patch and you don't need to send back all the same, all the fields? What if you only need to send back a patch of the name? Now, how do you implement that with codable? Traditionally, you have to have a whole new type. So you have to have a user type, which you might use by default, but then you have to have like a user patch struct, which implements just the one property you need to 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 turn into JSON to push as a patch. What you might okay. want to do is have a single source of truth where you have one, you know, like you, you have like you know, one user type and then you can like you can somehow somehow manipulate it, you know, so that you can have multiple conformances that you can easily use and not have to repeat yourself. And so that, that goes in a whole discussion about um, protocol witnesses, which is a thing that came from the point free world. It's a functional programming concept where, and you can convert any protocol into a, into a protocol witness, but it, it gets more complicated as the protocols get more complicated. But essentially what it breaks down to is you create a struct instead of a, um, instead of a protocol. <clears throat> and then the, okay. the struct has, functions on it that represent the things that were in the protocol and you add some generics in the right places that take the place of the uh of of like something like a associated type or of self in the, the original okay. protocol and trying to explain it with talking is really hard you need to just look at it it makes more sense but the idea is you end up with a struct that has like function closure properties on it for the most part right. that's how, that's what you end up with and this means that in and you don't and you have a what they call it protocol witness because the the concrete type that you create that you implement and then you implement with the the different f- uh, function closures on is a witness to the protocol. It's a compiler time proof that you have implemented like a particular protocol, even though you don't actually have a protocol anymore. There's no like there's literally no protocol that exists. Nothing's conforming to a protocol. You've translated it into a concrete type. And the advantage of this is that you then just make new versions of the concrete type. So you have one type, right? And you just make different versions of it and you override those functions. There's, there's closure functions. They could be anything you want. So you can have a live version of it, which has you know, your API calls, for instance, that go out to what, and then you can have a test version of it, which means the same function call to get user just returns some hard coded value to use for your preview or something. And you don't have to make like a user type and then like a mock user struct and then a test user struct. You don't have to make different structs. You make 
you can just make the, you use the same struct you just make you know different instances of it and it's really really useful and it's like the foundation of the dependency library that uh they they release as part of the composable architecture but, you can, but i use it separately and okay. uh it's it's a technique and and they wrapped it up into a nice is, easy to use kind of library is that, much, that does you, most you of, use it more but, around your tests or is this other particular reasons for using it for your own use case i'm using i use a dependency library because in their world they 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 made a they made a library that mimics the swift ui environment so it's a little this is not strictly like protocol witnesses but it's <clears throat> but the way it works is they they made a library where it 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 works like the environment you create an a like a struct essentially to wrap your dependency whatever that is and then you have to define versions of the dependency like live and test and and mock you know or you know for like or preview whatever and so you have to at least give it a live dependency and then it it lives in its own in the in the dependency kind of environment so you use a property wrapper to inject it in, you know to 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 have access to it you use a property wrapper and and then just like in the environment in switch UI environment uh where you just say you know at environment and then you gain access to the instance of that dependency mm -hmm. this works but this works outside of a swift ui view like you can use it in a regular you know class or struct or something somewhere else in your app that's why it's useful but it, it mimics that same behavior where there's like some central there's obviously some central place where in memory where all this stuff lives okay you know but you just you know you know so you could build this by hand but i mean it, essentially it's kind of like a version of if you made a uh one giant struct that had like or you know that had all of your dependencies as properties on it i think it's kind of like that it's uh it's cool because that way you can um in you know inject these things in in different places and uh be able to access them and the main benefit of it though is uh like it's easy and it's, there's one place for you to go there's one single source of truth because it's kind of like it's like a protocol witness style where you you owe you you build your dependency as a series of function closures Right, not as a protocol that you're conforming to. You don't conform to your protocol. You you wrap it with these function closures. So then, I can override whatever you want for for test and for for previews and whatever. And so, like Got that's it. that's kind of why it it it's kind of in the protocol witness uh, space, I think. Uh, and it's uh, useful. I if you've never done any pro looked at protocol witness stuff, there's a lot of. I'll put. I'm gonna. I mean, it's gonna take me a while to get all these links together for this one. <laughs> I put link. I put links in for the uh, protocol yes, witness yes, stuff from Point Free, um, NS Screencast. I didn't even know they had this the NS Screencast. Like I think a year ago, they had some. Had, again, it all it all ties back to Point Free. I, I feel. I feel like this should be a nice little demo for our Billy Coco heads meeting. Uh, okay, that's a good point. That's a good point. I should make a demo. I, I should make it's a demo one, of something. Doesn't, 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 yeah, something really simple. A... Just it just shows how to translate between the two and what it means. Yeah, that's a yes. good point. So uh, because because that's out. that's another way. Uh, but if it comes, I, if, if it's before December fourteenth, you can you can come to the meetup then and and watch. Steve yeah, this this will be out. This will be out. Now we have to do a demo. But this will be out before December fourteenth. Yes. Perfect. This will be yeah. out. If Perfect. you're listening to this when it's released, it's going to be released December fourth, uh, I think. Yeah. So. Yeah. Perfect. So. But anyway, the point was, I guess, all that rambling was, you're essentially need to find a way when you have like dependencies in your app to like wrap them in some way so that you have like an abstraction, like an interface, a protocol, a protocol witness, so something where it's like. You're centralizing your dependencies. You can control it in one place. You can swap them out potentially. Like it depends on how far you want to get down the rabbit hole. One common thing that comes up with with management is something like um, Swift data or core data. Mm -hmm. It's like, do you build an entire abstraction around that? So, or do you just use Apple provided, uh, you know, tooling like a like Query or you know, Fetch request good, wrapper? That's a good question. I mean, in Swift UI, it, it, it's it's even more. <laughs> It's a challenging point where you have to sort of like it's just easier just to get you know use their property wrappers and just get. You can't test the, stuff uh, that way though. Tests. <laughs> well, the, tests. like <laughs> like a lot of a lot I mean, of the stuff. It, I get it, I get it. I'm joking, I'm joking. The, the TCA <laughs> stuff. Uh, I mean uh, the, the 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 composable architecture stuff that I've been really looking into and and playing around with. Sure. Like a lot of the impetus for that is so that you can test things and testing mm -hmm. things is very important. <laughs> you, I mean, we, we've talked about it before. Like, it is important to write tests at it least at least some of the time. 
uh, we're not going to go into like a religious war about like TDD or something, but it's like, you know, everybody writes at least some tests for some things. It depends on, on your, your, your specific situation, but, but you know, you got to test things <laughs> yes, some way. Yes, okay. Yes, yes. Let me put it this way. And you have to test yes, yes. things that's, in some way, whether or not you're writing unit that's, that's tests is different, important. but yes. I mean, if you're running your app at all, yeah, if you're good. So one thing that proper dependency management allows you to do is even if you're not writing automated tests, if you want to test your app in the simulator or you want to test your app in previews and you don't want to get live data, you want to control the data that's going that, that's showing up because you want to make sure the screen yes. looks right or you want to make sure some business logic works right. Like you need some way of doing that. And, and in order to do that, you need to have some abstraction that lets you change the behavior of the dependency without changing the call sites when yeah. you use a dependency. So that's why I use like a protocol does that. A protocol witness can do that once you understand that concept. Uh, and like that's what the idea of various techniques of wrapping dependencies. You say like you'll create your own type and inside that type it actually uses like the, the more concrete dependency but then your code depends on your own type. Like the, these, they're all just variations on a theme of saying like I wrote a type that I can control that defines an API contract and then um, I'm using something else, like I'm using core data, I'm using whatever, but you don't yeah. necessarily know that as a call at the call site. And it's important because especially in the era, I think of Swift previews that I found I've had a lot of struggle trying to make, trying to write stuff that is testable and like that works in previews that doesn't require yeah. you to go live. Like if you, if you, do, and I, I think basically you, you need to, you need to build everything in Swift UI with like view models essentially is the primary way of dealing with this. But you need to have your you need to have a way of injecting that 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 into yeah. a preview because yeah. a preview a preview is like just to remind people if you if you know previews are one hundred percent your control. It's like you have to build up the entire environment. So it doesn't matter if you're three levels deep in your app and you're depending on the environment stuff that you injected up at the top. It's not there in that preview. You have to inject it into that preview. Do everything okay. that that yeah. was maybe well, done for you up the per- whole stack in order for it to work. Particularly when you're talking about like a core data, like a core data, um, like mm-hmm. database that you have to sort of inject, uh, like inject, like inject the the data model in the database before you set the preview. So that's yeah, that's where this yeah, that's one way. That's that is a way of doing it. Yeah, dealing. Th- yeah, it's, it's not great. With Swift data, you have to like a wrong. test yeah. context. Yeah. 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 But I mean, it, it is, um, at least with Swift data and core data, you can basically just make d- dummy data like in the, in yeah, the, that's, that's what you end up doing. And, and like you can make either a dummy database literally and load a different database or you can literally, you can make like an in-memory store that you just build up some other way and then you but, can just inject that in this. And because... Yeah. They use like some com. They use like a protocol or something. I don't. Right. I think that's how it's something. in there. Right. It's like a <laughs> protocol. So everything's a protocol from Apple makes. Everything is a freaking protocol. Yes. I guess the um, you know one of the interesting things that I know I've done in the past, particularly or I've, errors I've made in the past, I should say, is um, be too dependent on third party libraries in regardless of the code. So in the sense of like if I have a UI form. Uh, like, I think I used like Excel form, but it was such a buggy library that um, like I had to go in and like fork my own version of it and like modify that uh, because it was, it, you know, the group wasn't particularly responsive for my particular need. They already had tons of bugs for us. Excel things. form? Yeah, that was, a, that was an old library. I, know, I don't even know. Objective-C. Um, that's how old it was. I don't even know what uh, that is, but it was... It, it... Yeah, it was meant to be an easy way to like construct form-based UI. Um, oh, because form based UI things. is it is crazy. Yeah, it, People think it's it, easy. It's not you, you, the proliferation of code for any given form is nuts. Everybody it's wants it's better form code. It, it forms are so people, hard. Like they're they're just so tedious. Argue. They're so people. It, it, the one of the things that they don't like doing is like I swear designers are the worst in this regard of like saying I want to go into a detail view. Like anytime you have a long list of items. They want to get that. Um, they want to get the. They want it to get it resolved in the same view. So if you want to type some form, long form text, they want to do it inside the form, not move you into oh, like yeah. a detail, like a, a very specific 
you know, full, you know, detailed view. So they want in line. All the space in the world. They yeah. want it in line. And I'm just like, guys, just give up on that dream. <laughs> like, <laughs> give them the dream. But or, that, uh, that, 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 that was like, or they would want like inline drop down, which is, you know, even Apple does that. But the, the, the funny part is like, sometimes it's okay. Just put it in, like, especially if you have like a state, you know, that you have to pick or maybe several states, you have to just put, put them into a detailed view of list of stuff and bring them back. It's okay. They it's just on, on iOS. I mean, yeah, it's just, you know, it's just, it's just, it's ridiculous. actually more like, natural often. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it, that's the thing. Like they don't. If it's, if it's a long they, list of things, you don't want it. You don't want it in line on a file iPhone. Yeah. If you want to go to another screen? You can scroll. Design designers, I I beg you, just give that dream up. <laughs> I mean, we have Swift UI now, so transitions can be a little more imaginative. Yeah. But like, just like let let the content. So. As we're as we're as we're yeah, as we're wrapping up, I think. The you this is a good point that you're making about, you know, don't be too dependent on, on a particular thing or in your case, I guess fork it if you have to. But like what are some other tips for for handling dependencies oh, yeah. or like like for, for maybe more of the, the like what you should think of when you're when you're mm-hmm. even um thinking about any given dependency? And I think one of them is, you know, think about the long term, as you were saying, the long term consequences of it changing in an incompatible way, which then leads think- to how you would structure your code. Yeah, I mean, if your moat is dependent on a third party backend, so like I go back to like Dividend Calc, um, the app is great until the backend decided to like, you know, because it was a startup. It was I, IEX Cloud, um, really wonderful service, great APIs. I thought it was, you know, it was a fantastic deal at like a hundred bucks um, a year, really, at that time. Yeah. Um, you should know better <laughs> because that, that changed real quick um, to be, you know. Yeah, so dividend calc. Yeah, it got too expensive to be to be um, to work on right. your business model, right. and that's a good and, point. Now, I'm not saying that never, never do that. I mean, there's just certain kinds of functionality that, like, you were not going to be able to build your own system to give you real time. Uh, no, no, you know, dividend. Like, so it was just a matter of which version of these things exist and how much do they cost, yeah. and is it going to work for my yeah. business model? And sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it does. Right. Um, similarly, I think right now, if you're doing AI, AI stuff, open AI, you're doing things so with like LM from, stuff, yeah, from like a platform level, just understand like yeah. what are your what are your options, and as long as you have more multiple ones that you can like sort of depend on or switch to as need be. And they all act relatively the same, and it's not the core functionality of your app or your product. Yeah, great. And if it Go is, it. and if it is, you just have to know mm-hmm. that, and you have to just understand that that is a risk. Yes, but yes. sometimes it's worth it. Like a lot of people made, I think, a lot of money, you know, building things right on OpenAI's um, systems right now. In these, the you know, they, they 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 jumped on that wave of excitement and built some apps, and that are essentially just using chat gpt or you know or something and they're making making money like i've seen a bunch of examples of things actually are a little more clever than just using chat gpt but like yeah. they're using those services to to do things uh that um are then there that are that are then they're charging for and they're making money so but they're completely dependent on you know open i doubt you would be able to easily switch to anything else right now i don't know for sure but like i don't think there is like a direct one-to-one comparable service you can just switch to like easily you know, if OpenAI disappeared. So, but that's a risk. Right. Um, and besides, besides the, the that's like a platform uh, risk right. issue. So, so if we're talking uh, like I think, third party APIs like a pod file or anything like that, obviously, if you yeah. can, you can fork it or find a way to mirror it, that'd be great. Um, and there are plenty of services out there. To oh, that's, that's, that. that's a, uh, um, that's a good point. Um, so we were talking about this before the show started <laughs> about SPMs and Cocoa Pods and stuff. Uh, having access to the source code or the binaries, if you have, if it's a binary based release, but you need to have a copy. Like you cannot rely on the public GitHub repo for your production app during development. That's fine, but you, you better figure out a way of saving them on your own system somewhere because if they disappear five years down the road or, you know, you know, like you, you what are you going to do when you try to build your app and your continuous integration systems? If you use them, which you know a lot of places do, 
they they may not even be allowed to access like a public repo like that, especially in an enterprise environment. So you you have to have some strategy, and there's different ways of doing this. I don't exact. I'm still looking into SPM. I saw that um, SPM there there was a there was a Swift Evolution proposal that I think is actually implemented. It was called Package Manager Dependency Mirroring, where you could give it like another URL to to grab it from. So I guess you could mirror from using your own version of GitHub, your GitLab, and mirror the Git repo to your own oh, place, yeah. and then point and then set that up. I, that's one way. I've used Nexus a lot, and I don't think they support SPM, but I thought they do Cocoa Pods, and I know they do NuGet. On, but that's because like they all kind of, like um, SPMs don't have a central re- index. Like there is an index, but there's not like an official one, right? Yeah. Like NuGet, there's like an official index, and as far as I know, right? Like there's an official place you can you. You can point stuff to, and so the way Nexus worked for like NuGet is you would you would um, proxy to the index so that when you wanted to um, get a, a package, it would you'd go through the Nexus server. The Nexus would then go up to the main index, copy it to itself, and then give you the dependency essentially like that. Right. So that way you always had that version. Whatever version you use would automatically get mirrored. That to me is the ideal strategy. When I want a system where I point my tooling at it. And when and it just transparently and automatically saves the exact version I'm using. That's what I want. That's what Nexus does. They have an OSS version. I don't know how well it works for Apple Toolchain, but that's good. Mirroring the Git repo is another thing. Just copying it into the into your repository is also something you can do, which I've done with Coca Pods. You know, especially because there was nothing else to do at the time. I was using Coca Pods, uh, so you do have to make sure you you have some way of 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 you know having access to those dependencies in the future so you don't have a, a problem. I'm glad I did that with some old code because like there's some dependencies I have that do not exist anymore. <laughs> you know, like they're just right. I don't think yeah. they exist anymore. So, I think they're gone. Right. So it's right. it's like good thing I have that, that code somewhere. So I could give you some um you know what I know this is completely like off topic. There was just one thing I I got I found that was really cool as part of um the Swifty stack course I bought. It was really it's really good. I I actually highly recommend it. Uh, it's uh, but done by Marrow Marrowing, that Kristoff guy. Uh, okay. I, he's not sponsoring this or anything. I don't know him. I just think it's a it's a good course. He, <laughs> anyway, he he has all these like um, tools in this in this course uh, that I had not heard of before. And one of them, I, I think we actually talked about this in the past. I kind of vaguely remember this. We're like, how do you build a screen to do acknowledgments for all of your SPMs? Or Cocoa Pods? Well, oh, guess yeah. what? There's like a, attribute. There, attribute, the, att- the, att- attribution? Attribution? Yeah, yeah attribution. attribution list or acknowledgements list. There's there's at least one project that, that was listed in this in the stuff that does it. It's called Echnolist. I don't know, right? Okay. And I and all it does is it automatically generates a table view, essentially. It's like a switch UI view. Yeah. yeah which yeah, 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 then yeah. just links to shows all the licenses and it grabs it from all of your pods. So it's like all automagical. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah, that's yeah, perfect. Yeah, I'm yeah. totally going to yeah, yeah. use this thing. I'm totally going to use this, this thing. But is that, uh, is that for uh, is uh, just I pods just, or does it, does it support SPM? I, it worked for SPMs and, and Cocoa oh, Pods. Good, good, like, good. Look yeah, both. That's that's Because I think before so, like, I knew I, there was something like he is, um, pods, but I didn't know that it existed for SPM yet. Yeah, so one of the things that he gives you in this course and, and, and uh, was uh, a whole bunch of links to tools and stuff and he shows you how to hook them up he gives you like a template so i was playing so i was playing around with this template because i wanted to play around with inject which is one of his projects that he's built which allows you to do live updating in the simulator and because on the on the slack we were talking about um previews and sometimes there's some issues with previews with uh you know stuff so uh uh and uh this was uh also one of the tools in that list though when i used his uh his little template file you get as part of the course i was like what is this thing in here i was like oh my god so I'll put that, I'll put the acknowledged, I'll put the Swifty stack thing in here if you're interested. Again, he's not a sponsor or anything and I don't know him, but I just, I've already gotten value from his, uh, his, uh, course here. So Great. check it out. Great. Uh, and so I guess we're over time. So, uh, Coltro is telling me we need to wrap up. So wrap yeah, up. I guess we should wrap, <laughs> should wrap up. Wave, wave wrap it up, Steve. <laughs> I know. All Cause right, we're not, so. I keep acting like we're recording the video of this, like, but, and we're not. At the uh, moment, uh, we're no. not pushing the video, so nope. Maybe we can do hand gestures. We can do hand gestures, yeah. and nobody will know. <laughs> Aaron's pointing the middle okay, finger. So at hopefully, me. hopefully, this was an enjoyable <laughs> for everybody. Hopefully, this was a useful, useful episode. We yeah. always have a plan. 
We just never quite in, follow it exactly in our, no, our, our outline. We're winging it 90% you know. of the time. <laughs> but uh, that's all we have for today. Uh, you can learn more about Philly Coco at phillycoco.org. There you will find links to our Slack group, meetup schedule, and contact info. If you're feeling generous, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever your podcast platform of choice is, and share us with all your developer fans. And one more thing. Uh, since we are taking a break um, this month, I am also taking a break from all the jokes. I just want to say I'm thankful for our time together that we always spend every other week. And I hope that everyone uh, who listens to us gets to spend and enjoy their time with their friends and family. And uh, please uh, embrace that experience because they're very sh- our time in this world is very short. And I just Hope that you enjoy your time with your friends and family. So until next time, good luck on your own developer journey. We will cheer for you always. Who needs battery life? I got to make my app pop. You got to make it pop.